Hi, my name is Hamei Watt. You're watching The Millionaire Student Show with Sasha. Hame, what was uh, some of the biggest lessons that you've taken away from running your many companies? Starting with a great team, uh, starting with a big vision, and buckling up for a long ride. So let's just say someone gets involved today in business, yeah, and they don't have that team. It's yeah. just a foundational phase. It's a one-man band, and they're trying to find that team. How do they get people to buy into their vision? Yeah. Well, they should start slow, for sure. Um, they should get real clear on what the whole culture of their organization is going to be and then start looking and start being very disciplined and realizing they have to block out time to actually do it. In my first company, I made a mistake. I actually didn't block out enough time in my day when I'm trying to raise capital and sell product and build product to actually go out and just spend time with people and realize that that design process is almost like designing a company or designing a product. You're designing a team, and that takes a lot of time and commitment. So you're very diversified. I mean, from the entertainment industry to the wellness and the tech, what is your strategy? Oh, that's a good question, because it's evolved over time. Um, I came out to LA, and Ken knows this. I came out to LA because I had this big thesis that the entertainment industry didn't fundamentally leverage technology the way they could. And I felt like, oh, okay, I'm going to be this technologist that's going to see all these opportunities and help the entertainment industry realize that. So that was my initial thesis coming to LA. And that meant I was going to be focused more on entertainment and media. After I sold my first company, I realized that I wanted to do something that was going to be more impactful and not so much necessarily around the altruism, but partially around that, but more around this magnitude of the markets. I got interested in healthcare. I got interested in wellness. I started thinking about the size of those markets and the impact that we can make in those markets. And so that's been a little bit more of my calling uh, as of late. And I'd say as of late, it's as of the last 10 years, I've been much more passionate and interested in uh, making the world a better place. But I don't mean that to, to sound like I, I only want to do it for the impact benefit. I'm very interested in doing it for the economic benefit as well. Um, and I just see the problems that need solving as big enough that they represent fantastic design opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities, but also big market uh, opportunities. You know, most entrepreneurs out there who start up businesses, they always, you know, solving a problem. Yeah. And um, I formulated a, a equation, P plus S equals O, problem plus solution equals the opportunity. Okay, I like so, that. So, you know, you have a problem and you want to go out there and solve it right now. Yeah. So you create the opportunity for people to buy in so they can generate some income. Right. But why is it, you know, right now as we speak, why is it the perfect time to get involved in entrepreneurship? Why is it the perfect time to start a business right now? You know what, it's debatable as to whether it is the perfect time. I would absolutely say yes, but I just want to throw it out there yes. that it is debatable because it's not for everyone. Uh, starting a company is not for everyone. Not everyone has the, the stomach to start a company. So that's an important note. I will say this. If we compare today as to 10 years ago, it's a in my opinion, it's a dramatically better time to start a company. Why? A lot of the infrastructure that it takes to start a company that used to be busy work, that used to be annoying, you're probably too young to, to, to remember this, but to get a website set up, you yeah. used to have, have to hire three or four people, right? Now you go on to Amazon and you're, you're, you're up, right? So that's just one example of the infrastructure layer that's there today, not to mention all of the wonderful outsourced systems that you can do now to, to build something and to, to take the components that you don't like and find an outsourced solution or a service that will allow you to do those things and really allow you to focus on the thing that you do like or the special idea. So that's what's so exciting to me about this time to start a company. And, you know, for most people, you know, they don't really understand figures. It just doesn't, it, it doesn't click with them. They don't get the whole commas because it becomes overwhelming and unrealistic to most people out there. At, at what point did you allow the numbers to become your friend? You mean people get 
bogged down with thinking about they definitely do because they yeah. have such a short-term vision they don't yeah. see not the money goal but the whole creation goal and they, they should look grab at that figures. damn napkin and make sure that napkin helps convince them when i say the napkin i mean the very simple numbers are really what drives the business i do think that if people are uncomfortable with that they may need to think about doing something else because i do think you have to have this killer instinct that thinks about oh, it's going to cost me uh, this, but I'm going to be able to sell it for that, right? Or I'm going to build it with this and this lower cost and sell it for this much higher cost. I do think that at the at the gut, someone has to have that basic sense and interest and passion to take something that's small, create value and sell it for something that's much larger. And that's just the napkin test. Yeah, and most people can't see beyond their eyelashes. So don't chase something Yes. that you know you're not going to reach because that's going to push you out the game. Yes. Um, you know, say, you say as an entrepreneur, you are primed to be kicked in the shins. Yeah. And um, what have you personally been through in business that has shaped and formed the you today? You talking what are about some related, of the experiences? Related to being kicked in the shins yeah. and the nuts and every other, okay. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Uh, Go for it. Okay, all right, good. You can be as um, real, transparent, yeah. and real. Uh, what, sorry, what has shaped my thinking after having been kicked? In yes. The, Oh, gosh, so much. Um, I'd say that just uh, being able to 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 be in tune with one's gut is really important. Um, and I say that to say that if you get to a place where you listen to your gut and you can trust your gut and you can move forward and go after something, for example, that your gut is telling you to go after, then you won't look back and have regrets regrets are the thing that really hurts. Regrets hurt way more than getting kicked in the nuts or shins or anything else. Regrets are when you kind of feel like, damn, I need to do this. I know I can do it. Yes, I have some insecurities because because we all do or I'm nervous about these things, but I really should go ahead and do this. And then you allow someone to talk you out of it or you allow someone to, this is the real danger. Getting kicked is sometimes better than getting politely nudge i put that in 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 quotes because oftentimes we can be discouraged away from something we believe in and that our gut tells us to do even because a loved one might say i don't know if you should go down this direction and that doesn't mean you don't listen to your loved ones it doesn't mean you don't take advice from lots of smart people but it means if you feel something in your gut you got to go for it or you're going to have regrets and that's real pain so let's just say I formulate a brand new company right now in the tech space, something that you've mastered, something that you look into. Um, I have the idea and not the finances. At what point should I approach you and how much of groundwork should I have already completed? Um, that's a good question. So I wear my investor hat and I, I, have to, I have to say that I sometimes wear an investor hat and I sometimes wear an entrepreneur hat. And I'm more comfortable, if I'm being honest, in an entrepreneur hat because I've lived it longer. Um, when someone is coming to me with my investor hat, um, I'm generally looking for them to have done the groundwork and for them to have communicated what I described earlier, which is they have a sense of value creation. They have a sense and they have a pragmatism for what it takes to create that value. And so I, I, those are some things I, 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 I highlight. Pragmatism with incredible vision coming together, to me, makes magic. So there are many times where people have incredible vision and they talk about the billion dollar company that they're gonna create or all the, the major things they're gonna do. But when it comes to pragmatically, one plus one equals two, when it comes to the pragmatics, you feel like either they're fundamentally underestimating what it takes or they don't care about it, which is even worse, or they're just not, they're just naive around that. Now, I think, the, and you take the person that has incredible pragmatism that they know one plus one, but they're not able to be persuasive around a big vision. That's dangerous too, especially with an investor hat on that needs to get a significant return. If that person can't see that vision themselves, how are they going to convince their employees, their investors, future buyers, anyone to actually do it? Um, so I like to look at the combination of those things. And in myself, with my entrepreneurial hat on, I try to make sure I have those two things too before I go after a new venture. Someone comes up to you, pitches you an idea, which you get very frequently. Yeah. 
you say no to them, that you don't want to invest into their idea. Yeah. Could that come across as, hey, it doesn't work for them? Could that come yeah. across as an opinion? Could that take them out the game? It could, but I try to have it not do that because I've been on the other side again more than I've been even on the investor side. And so I think, uh, you know, I try to be that, let me step back, I'll tell you a story. There's some, I don't know if you have any kids, but I have a child and he's now 14. And um, I'm trying to think if this story is going to work, but I'll, I'll go with it. Uh, there are times when you have a new baby and my baby was cute the whole time. But you know, if you have a new baby and maybe the baby's cute or not cute, like you don't want to show your not so cute baby to some the wrong person, right? You want them to see the cuteness. I shouldn't have used my son because he's been cute his whole time. If he's listening, <laughs> I want to make sure he knows that. Uh, but so when, when it comes to a new business or venture, it's actually quite delicate in the early stages, especially with high perform with, with strong people or people that have a lot of potential. And so especially when I see that, like when I see extraordinary potential in an operator or an entrepreneur or a visionary, um, I try to be careful not to do anything to extinguish that special flame, that special spark, because if anything, I want to enable that, even if I'm not going to be able to invest. And there's so many reasons why I may not invest that are beyond whether or not that's a good business or not. It's, I believe, uh, unfair for that entrepreneur to even feel like that. I don't want to even give them the sense that it's 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 them uh, because truly in many cases, it may be me as the investor. Um, when I do not like the idea, um, which is happens most of the time actually, um, it doesn't mean I don't like the person. It doesn't mean they may not figure out how to contort the idea or to partner with others that help them see the right direction and figure it out and they may figure it out. And I try to, wear an optimist, uh, uh, an optimist's lens uh, in, in having that kind of interaction and conversation. And even though on the other side of me, the very conservative investor side of me, I might be inside quantifying the risks and seeing that, wow, this is just too hard of an initiative or a naive approach to it or what have you. I'm careful in how I explain that because I wanna make sure I'm trying to celebrate that innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. Great. So the fastest way to travel from point A to point B is definitely a straight line. Yeah. And most people believe entrepreneurship is a straight line. What yeah. they don't realize is it's detours, it's up, down, left, right, and a lot of adversity. What mindset will make it in today's entrepreneurial world? That is a very good question. And I want to stay away from the really obvious question, a really obvious answer, which is grit. But I do think that's important. I'm sure it's one folks, of the traits. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that uh, your listeners uh, study grit. If they don't, they should. Um, one of the things that I've been digging into in my newest uh, efforts, um, and we're building a lab. Some people call it a foundry. Um, is really understanding how our brains are wired to innovate or not. Um, and the more I learn, we've been fortunate enough to brought on a number of uh, advisors who are neuroscientists and really dig into this, this issue. The more I've learned, the more I realize that the brain is actually wired to be pretty lazy, right? The brain consumes more oxygen and calories than any other organ by far in our body. And our natural state is to be fairly conservative and to conserve that sort of mental processing power or cognitive power. And oftentimes that can actually impact how we think about innovation. So you have to be intentional to really innovate. And I think that's what I look for most of all. I look for folks that have figured out a way to innovate. And I, I don't mean to, innovation is a way overused term. I actually don't think that many people truly innovate. And it, it's an uncomfortable, it can be an uncomfortable effort. And I look for that. And that leads me on to my next question. Do you believe innovating is a skill or is it will? Is it you have the desire to innovate or do you feel like, you know, it's something that you've developed over trial and error? One of the researchers um, did an incredible uh, research uh, effort on behalf of a very large hedge fund guy 
who makes billions of dollars and he hires incredibly smart people. And he told this researcher, uh, whose name is Bob, um, please tell me who the most creative people, who the most innovative people are. Codify the most innovative people in the world for me, right? Because everyone I hire is a Baker scholar from Harvard, or Yale, or Stanford. They're all smart. But there is a subset of them that dramatically overperforms. And the reason for that overperformance is their creativity or their innovation. So how do I codify that? And so he went out and he started studying the brains of the most creative people, right? He studied um, researchers, he studied artists, musicians, chefs, anyone who had peers that would say, you are best in class from an innovation standpoint. And he put them under fMRI brain scans and looked at their diaries and behaviors. And he learned a lot of interesting things. And I'm gonna get to your question. This is a roundabout way to get to it. But one of the things which may be obvious is the most creative people created the most works, right? They were the most active in terms of creative works. Picasso, I think there's a debate as to whether he did 10,000 or 50,000 paintings, right? 50,000 pieces of work. Even if it's 10,000, it's a lot, right? And clearly regarded as one of the most creative artists of his time and in, in, uh, in the world. Um, and so that trend was consistent or that pattern or behavior was consistent across all of the innovators. More volume, more muscle around innovation equaled better innovation. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about his research was that he looked at Asian fusion with soul, fu soul food, like Asian food and soul food coming together or uh, fusion food, fusion chefs uh, do something special. And that's kind of innovation. They're innovating in, in cuisine. And what he said was that was a pattern that was consistent across all innovators as well. They could take seemingly very different worlds and combine them and do that a lot of different times and ways to come up with really powerful breakthroughs. So it's a it's a combination of both skill and will. I think it is. I think it's skill to be able to think about these disparate worlds. Sorry, actually, I'm coming back to you. Yeah. To think about the 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 different worlds and the fusion and coming together. And I think it's will, to your point, by really pushing hard and 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 doing creative works and not being discouraged. I will say that being an innovator and being an entrepreneur may be different, because you may be able to innovate and you may have the will it takes to innovate but that does not necessarily mean you have the will to go out and hire and raise capital and talk to the press and build a product and hire the people that might be hard to hire and fire the people that may need to be fired. All those other things that are required and break through walls with customers, all those things that are required to be an entrepreneur may be different than being an innovator. What is your vision on how to change the tech space? I think it needs to be significant. Let me see. Let me stop because that sounds preachy. Uh, I didn't mean to sound preachy. Um, my vision on what it takes to change the tech space is that we need to think aggressively about what real innovation is. I think we need to be significantly more inclusive. I'm sure your listeners are familiar with the data. Very small percentage of underrepresented groups in the innovation ecosystem broadly. And that's broad. That includes big companies like Facebook and Netflix and others. Not only the founder ranks, which is even less represented from underrepresented groups. Here's the challenge with that. If you have a group that represents about 30% of the population that you believe has some nuanced understanding of the problems that need solving, but they're not represented in the, in the, in the innovation design table or in the product development process or world or ecosystem, then you're sub-optimized for innovation. And that's a that's a challenge. And so that is one of the things I would want to do to, to correct it. The other is to really break up and sort of rip up some of the traditional rule books for company creation. Um, having sat at upfront and 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 seen just an enormous amount of investment activity and venture you know, there are many patterns that I've seen that are the anti-pattern, meaning there are entrepreneurs that said, hey, the business, the business school book says go right and I'm going left. And they've been rewarded for that. And I think that's really what it, it's about, being rebellious and breaking some rules that haven't been broken in a long time or going in a different direction 
uh, because your your gut is telling you that or your observations are telling you something different than what they teach in the school books. Before we wrap this up, this question would have been totally different 10 years ago. Yeah. In today's world, right now as we speak, would you look at e-commerce app developments or would you start to look at tangible physical business? Well, I think it very much depends, but certainly if all things being equal, like if I had a choice between uh, building a business for a humongous market with a physical product or building a business for a humongous market with a digital product, I would much rather do it with a digital product for many of the obvious region, reasons. Margin, inventory, logistics, complexity, scalability, all those things matter. Um, and so I uh, don't stray away from hardware um, because there are some markets that you need hardware to go after them. Um, but there are many that do not need hardware and uh, those are, are super exciting. So let's just say I formulate a company. I'm in a third world country right now. I don't yeah. have access to someone like you yeah. who has the financial backing to uh, finance my company. How do I take it to the next level without an investor? Yes, I think that's a great question. And it goes back to your first question, which is why is it such a great time to start a company now? One of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons it's a great time to do it is because you don't need as much, arguably, to build a base business with nothing. Um, you can uh, can can begin to with, with very humble beginnings, prove that you're creating some value. And the other thing that's nice about today is uh, access to capital has become more dem uh, democratic. It's not fully democratic or uh, democratized, but it is becoming more democratized. And so if you have something special and you've been able to visualize that special thing um, or begin to prove that you're doing something, there's always someone that would rather invest than, than rolling up their sleeves and doing that hard work because they can see a, a clear return. Um, and so it's about, even if it's very small, starting to prove again with that pragmatism that you can put enough together to turn something into something more valuable. Himei, thank you so much for your time, your expertise and your wisdom, uh, not just on the tech space, but also in entrepreneurship as a whole. And we appreciate you for being on the Millionaire Student Show. Thank you.